This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. This week's guest is Frank Hyman, a certified mushroom forager who teaches mushroom identification to chefs, arborists, organic farmers, and the general public. Frank's latest book is called How to Forage for Mushrooms Without Dying and contains guidance on mushroom identification, on your suitability for becoming a mushroom forager, on which subject he writes, if you have a reputation among your friends and family for exercising poor judgment, you may not be a very good candidate, about the sniffy attitude of the English to mushrooms versus that of mainland Europeans, and a whole host of other micro-related topics that should help you in your quest to survive foraging. Despite dealing with a potentially lethal topic, both book and author are laugh-out-loud funny, and I was delighted that Frank agreed to an interview. He begins by talking about what motivated him to write about foraging and not dying. So what motivated me to write this book is that uh, in my growth as a mushroom hunter, I found that uh, the books that I had access to, the common mushroom ID books, were all they were all good enough to help me along, but they were not aimed. They were really not aimed at beginners. They were, uh, when I stood back to look at my books that I had on the shelf, what I realized was that they were all written by mycologists, by which I mean uh, a person with a master's or a PhD in mycology. Uh, A random person interested in mushrooms is not a mycologist. But so these books were all written by degreed mycologists But it was also became clear their audience was other mycologists and not so much. uh, They did not see their audience so much as beginners who did not have a facility with Latin uh, and who were not interested. uh, A lot of beginners like uh, myself are not interested in so many of the details about a given mushroom if those details don't help you identify that mushroom and separate it from any dangerous lookalikes. So there was lots of uh, material in most of the mushroom ID books that was, did not separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Uh, And I felt that uh, these, these mycologists were writing for other mycologists and kind of saying, Hey, I've learned a lot of Latin and I'm going to use it. And uh, so it was, so these books are good. I use them. I own a bunch. I encourage people to get them, but they were not written for beginners. And I have uh, been able to master a number of different professions, partly because I'm comfortable and I enjoy what's called beginner's mind, where you go into something just not knowing and, uh, and you fill in the pieces. And so I was able to look at I was able to revisit beginner's mind of a mushroom hunter and write a book for that person, essentially writing a book for me 15 years ago. So that's what inspired me to write this book. Uh, Before we go any further, I should mention, obviously, you're based in the US. And I have read that there is a danger in taking a mushroom guide from one country or continent and using it in another. Is that the case? Uh, l- let me answer that by saying yes and no. So the the truism among mycologists is that in the temperate regions of the northern hemisphere, which would include the U.S., Canada, England, Europe, uh, and uh, and a swath of Asia, so the temperate regions of the northern hemisphere, the mushrooms are pretty much the same partly because wind currents will carry the spores, partly because of globalization. So when Europeans loaded up their horses and other animals and their hay and whatnot and came to the uh, North American continent, they were bringing spores of their mushrooms, of the common European mushrooms. And so there is a lot of consistency in the mushrooms in the northern Northern Hemisphere temperate regions. Uh, that being said, it is worth uh, taking an extra pinch of salt in uh, in identifying uh, mushrooms using a guidebook from another country. Uh, but I'm confident because of the way my book is structured uh, 
that folks in the UK and Ireland and and Europe generally will find it to be a useful book in identifying mushrooms um, uh, that I cover in the book. I was thinking as well, in the book, you mention I think, three different types of mushrooms. Could you maybe briefly discuss what they are? And is there one type that seems sure. to be more edible than others? Uh, yeah, I can answer that for you. The uh, So there's three types of mushrooms, and mycologists describe them using Latin terms and technical terms that I'll forego for the sake of our discussion. And I decided I would come up with, I'm a writer, I'll come up with some terms that a beginner can remember and that are also more descriptive. And so the most common mushrooms that people are likely to find uh, in the store are mushrooms that can be farmed, that can be grown. And all of those mushrooms can be farmed because they live off of dead organic matter. So they live off a compost or wood chips or dead trees or dead leaves in the ground. And I call those mushrooms eaters of the dead. I I thought that would stick in people's minds and help them, you know, and it just explains what's going on. These are mushrooms living off of dead material, dead organic matter. And hence, those are the only kinds of mushrooms that can be farmed where you take some logs from a tree or some sawdust or wood chips or or wheat chaff, what have you, hay, straw, and you can grow mushrooms, edible mushrooms on that because they are eating that dead organic matter. So eaters of the dead. And examples of that would be at the store would be shiitake mushrooms or um, gosh, what do you call them in England? The, uh, The common button mushrooms. So those are eaters of the dead. They are commonly farmed. You can get them at the grocery store. They are not very common in Europe, uh, or the shiitake is not uh, uh, commonly found in the woods in Europe or North America. But ones that are, that are in this book, are puffballs. And I think puffballs co-evolved with human children, kicking them to release the spores. (laughs) So there was some collaboration there in the ancient times. Uh, (laughs) My personal theory, but uh, so puffballs are in uh, pastures and meadows, things like that. So that's just one example of eaters of the dead. The another type of mushroom would I call them eaters of the living, uh, and so some people call them parasites. So mushrooms like honey mushrooms that are they have that name because of their color, not because of their taste. Unfortunately, uh, they're a, they're a good enough mushroom, not one of the best as far as I'm concerned in terms of uh, taste. But they are living off of the living parts of trees. And so they are actually killing trees, uh, honey mushrooms. So they're uh, eaters of the living. The third type of mushroom make their way in the world by collaborating with tree roots. So the tree is uh, uh, doing photosynthesis and eating sugars. And the tree roots provide some sugars to the mushroom. And the mushroom, conversely, in its underground mycelia, or its roots functionally is able to better able to extract moisture and nutrients from the soil. And so it swaps that to the tree. So the mushroom is giving nutrients and water to the tree roots and the tree roots are giving sugar to the mushroom. So they're collaborating. And I call these, this third group of mushrooms, I call them the marrying kind because they have like married up with some tree and a variety of trees and uh, are collaborating, sharing nutrients back and forth. And examples of those mushrooms would be morels and chanterelles. So that's the reason that those mushrooms are not farmed because nobody has really figured out how to recreate that kind of underground collaboration in a way that it would allow you to farm chanterelles. So that's the three kinds as, as the marrying kind. Are the edible mushrooms found in any one of those particular groups with more frequency or are they, is it kind of even distribution? It's, it's, I would say it's an even distribution. I would say the smallest number of edibles would be found in the eaters of the living. Uh, and probably the greatest number would be found in the eaters of the dead because, hey, the uh, forests are very successful in the northern hemisphere. And so there's tons of organic matter just laying around. In fact, here's an interesting uh, story that I include in the book, which is that uh, all of the oil and coal that we 
access that our economy depends on right now, that oil and coal all came from dead organic matter, uh, layers and layers of dying trees, time when mushrooms, the eaters of the dead mushrooms, essentially did not ex exist. And so that organic matter would pile up and pile up and pile up over eons and then get buried and compressed and turn into coal or oil. And somewhere along the way, fungi evolved into becoming eaters of the dead because there was all this dead matter laying around and nature abhors waste. And so the eaters of the dead started breaking down the organic matter, turning it into their own bodies and then decomposing and being a nutrient source for other plants. And so that's why coal and oil are not being created on this planet anymore. Fascinating to think of what would happen if they those things didn't exist at all or never had existed. I think probably from the title of your book, um, and if people didn't deduce from the title of your book that some of your writing is quite tongue in cheek and there's a lot of humour peppered throughout, they may have had a clue from your names for the three categories of types of mushrooms. Um, you are quite cutting about my compatriots and our mycophobia. Um, do you have a theory as to why countries? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I forgive you. It's true. Um, why are we so mycophobic? Have you got a theory about it? Yeah, I let me let me apologize for a moment. I did not know what you were talking about. I was like, what negative things could I have said about English people? But then I remembered. Yes. So here's here's the story is that uh, you and I and, and our peers uh, most likely grew up, whether growing up in America or England or other English speaking countries have generally grown up with this tremendous fear of mushrooms. And our parents would reinforce this, say, oh, don't eat them. They'll kill you. Mushrooms are deadly. And uh, so when I first became interested in mushrooms, this was the overriding fear that, oh, my God, people would say things like, oh, my God, even experts can't tell them apart. Oh, my God, it's so scary. And I was like, wow, I should be really concerned and careful. And as I got into it, it became clear oh, there's a lot of mushrooms that are not that hard to tell apart from the dangerous ones. Quite easy. In fact, uh, chanterelles are easy to tell from jack-o'-lanterns, just as one example. But people frequently make a mistake with that. But that's a whole other story. But um, so in my experience in traveling, because I've spent like a year of my life traveling around Europe different times, in many places, the grandchildren can take you out mushroom hunting and say, yeah, don't eat that one but we eat that one all the time and they know the difference and it's not a big deal and people aren't afraid and so from that experience i started digging a little deeper and found that this fear this mycophobia this fear of mushrooms that i had growing up in america turned out was also common in um, british isles canada australia and new zealand and that pretty much on the rest of the planet even the grandkids can tell the good ones from the bad ones and so there isn't any real historical Rosetta Stone that says, yes, on this date, people in England decided that mushrooms were too scary to be bothered with. And so I hatched a theory with no, no scientific uh, grounding or historical grounding, but just like built on what I know about European history, that the English kind of separated themselves from the folks in the continent with this feeling of superiority. And I joke that the English want to separate themselves so much that they even drive on the wrong side of the road, mm -hmm. and which gets great laughs in America. It probably would not be a good line <laughs> if I was um, – giving this talk in England, but, uh, but this, and, and maybe you, you folks even have a word for it, this sense that the people on the continent are just not as smart or as wise as the English and they are foolishly eating. And I have seen uh, descriptions of this kind from the 1500s where English uh, writers would say, oh, those foolish continentals eating mushrooms from the dung heap, you know, how foolish and risky and, we Englishmen are too smart to eat these dangerous mushrooms. Uh, and so that was my theory was that it was part of this whole separation of uh, superiority towards the continent. And a colleague of mine, a uh, brilliant fellow named Sam Thayer, T-H-A-Y-E-R, who has some fabulous 
books about foraging for wild plants. I've uh, communicated with him about this theory. He has a different theory that also makes a lot of sense. He says that uh, in places where people had a fear of mushrooms, it was be what was uh, common in those places was there was always plentiful access to protein to deer or cattle, what have you. And that in places that experienced privation and starvation, so Eastern Europe, you know, and, and Russia being overrun by uh, various Asian tribes and subjected to battle and starvation, they were forced to deal with the uh, trial and error of finding out which mushrooms were edible and which ones would kill you. So that is his theory is that that was the challenge all, all over the globe, that if there was enough starvation, that people would gather the mushrooms and eat them and remember, oh, yeah, that's the mushroom that cousin Ivan ate and he died. So let's not eat that one. Take a note. Hmm. And so people remember the dangerous ones because somebody had like eaten them and, and the, the poisonous ones uh, have the uh, misfortune of also being very tasty. So you're hungry, you gather some mushrooms, you cook them up and like, wow, that's, and then uh, the person who ate the red one in a few days, they're dead. So they take a note of that and work their way through this trial and error period. And, uh, but only because they had like, you know, hunted out the wildlife in their region or because they were a band of folks who had been attacked by some other band and lost their source of food. And so they were forced to experiment. And that's how so many people on the planet became familiar with which mushrooms were good or bad. His theory is that like England uh, developed, a, you know, a cattle had plenty of deer and a cattle industry and North America, the American, uh, the Native Americans or the First Nations people had, uh, they were new to that continent. So they had plenty of wildlife and were never hungry enough to experiment with the mushrooms. So it's, it's, and there's, uh, I've read two or three other theories that, you know, seem in various degrees viable and perhaps different theories applied more in different areas. It's, uh, but there isn't some document. Nobody's going to, probably no one is going to uncover some document that explains, yes, our people eat mushrooms for this reason, or here's a document where our people don't eat mushrooms for this other reason. So it's kind of, um, various degrees of speculation with various degrees of historical backup. But I think Sam Thayer's theory is uh, the, the one with the most scientific backing, the most historical backing, and just the most reasonable storyline, I think, that uh, hungry people tried all the mushrooms. And if you weren't that hungry, you didn't try the mushrooms. So... Yeah. Well, I mean, given the fact that we only recently voted to divorce ourselves from continental Europe, I think there's probably a lot of validity to your theory. But um, aside from that, you did mention uh, a mushrooms growing in dung heaps. And I wondered, should we be careful of the soil that mushrooms are growing in? I mean, can they accumulate things like heavy metals or could they potentially be tainted by something that they're growing in or with? <laughs> So good question. So uh, uh, let me say that a lot of people say, oh, you shouldn't harvest mushrooms from the roadside because of lead and the gasoline and cadmium in the tires. And I've talked to somebody who worked for the EPA and as a mushroom hunter, they had done research on roadside chemicals and they'd found that lead and cadmium had been outlawed long enough ago that the rainfall over those decades has carried that lead and cadmium away from the roadsides. And now all that, all those heavy metals are at the bottom of our drinking reservoirs. <laughs> so um, uh, 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 an improvement, at least for the roadsides. So I generally find that I, I'm not concerned about mushrooms that I find on the roadside. Often I'll find uh, edible mushrooms like chicken of the woods and hen of the woods and lion's mane growing on street trees. And I feel like those are safe to harvest. A uh, concern I would have would be mushrooms growing along railway lines where they use pretty toxic chemicals to keep weed trees down, as you might imagine, and that 
mushrooms would absorb those chemicals. Or if you're in some garden that's kept pristine through the use of herbicides, the mushrooms would absorb those chemicals. Uh, I will say that most uh, landscapes I've been in, whether residential landscapes or public gardens, uh, it's using herbicides is an, ex an expensive option. And most places do most places, not all places, most landscapes do not use herbicides. Uh, a lot of uh, public gardens have enough volunteers, you know, pulling the weeds and things that they're, they don't have to uh, go that route. But I think most landscapes do not have enough herbicides in them. If it's in a lawn and you look at the lawn and the only thing you see is grass, then they probably do use herbicides. Any kind of lawn is going to have a mixture of broadleaf plants and grasses. And if, if you see that, then they're not using herbicides and it would be safe to pick them. But rail lines, I think, are the worst place for getting picking up chemicals like that. In terms of, uh, you asked originally about dung heaps, the, uh, I don't think that mushrooms are going to be carrying, uh, in, in a chemical way, they're going to be carrying any bad diseases or anything, but they can have bacteria growing on them. So here's a useful way to think about mushrooms. Out in the field, mushrooms act somewhat like plants in that they send out spores the way a plant would send out pollen or seeds. So in the field, they act like plants. In the kitchen, mushrooms are more like meat in that they can be covered with bacteria. And so you, that's why you should cook them. That's why you should store them in the fridge. Don't leave them in the, in the counter overnight. Don't leave them in the backseat of a hot car during the day because the bacteria can just multiply and, uh, and you can make people sick that way. The most people who get sick from eating mushrooms in Europe and North America are people who have eaten an edible mushroom that had bacteria growing on it. So it's mostly a cases of food poisoning. So that's the more of a concern is how you handle the edible mushrooms once you get them is uh, keep them cool, keep them dry. Don't store them in plastic uh, because the humidity in there will promote the growth of bacteria. Store, gather them in a paper bag so the moisture can so the mushroom can breathe and the moisture can escape, put them in a cooler, put them in a fridge, and then cook them. Uh, there are a few mushrooms that can be safely eaten raw, but for the most part, for novices, my rule is you should cook your mushrooms in some butter or bacon fat, and, uh, and you'll be safe that way. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting um, because, you know, that sometimes you do, if you have mushrooms, even when they're fairly freshly bought out of the store, they can have a really almost like a fishy smell to them. And I assume that is the bacteria taking hold. Correct. Yes, that's what you're smelling. Uh, again, out in the field, mushrooms kind of act like a plant. In the kitchen, they act like meat and at home, you've been grocery shopping, you can leave carrots on the counter overnight and they won't go rotten and make you sick from eating them. But mushrooms on the counter overnight, yes, that can happen. Or mm. mushrooms in plastic where they can't breathe, that can promote bacteria and you can make people sick that way. And I don't know anybody that wants to do that. So mm. no. no, that's a very good hint, I have to say. Um, and also as on, along those lines, how would you clean a mushroom before eating it? Is it necessary to do that? Uh, it's recommended to do that. So. When you, you see so you've gathered some wild mushrooms, you put them in a paper bag, you get home, you put them in the fridge, in the crisper drawer for the vegetables is a good place to store them so they don't dry out as fast. You know, they, they should last, depending on the variety and their condition, they should be fine in the fridge for three, four, five, six, seven days. Uh, your mileage may vary. And, but do not wash them when you get them home. Only wash them just before you cook them. And a lot of cookbooks mistakenly say, oh, if you uh, clean them with water, they'll absorb the water and be nasty. So use a brush or something. And, and that turns out not to be true. Harold McGee, the, uh, the food author, has written a lot about the proper use of mushrooms. He really understands them very well. So you've gathered your mushrooms. They're in a paper bag in the fridge. It's time to cook them. You pull them out. Uh, run the faucet 
and hold the mushrooms under the water and they won't absorb moisture in a significant way. You can use the faucet to clean them, use your fingers, use a toothbrush, whatever, to get the little dirt and bugs out. And, uh, and what I like to do is uh, you can slice mushrooms, but I like to break them up by hand into bite-sized pieces. So uh, often they f it seems more like a piece of meat or fish or crab meat when you do that, depending on the mushroom. Uh, and so you, so you can wash them. That won't hurt them at all. And uh, when you're ready, to, you just let them drain on a paper towel or whatever. You don't need to take all the moisture off. But here's the key thing is that one of the issues with cooking mushrooms is that they, they're 80% moisture. And so normally people heat up the fat, the oil or the butter or the bacon fat, and then toss the mushrooms in and all that moisture comes out and they end up stewing in their own juices, which takes them longer to cook. It makes it hard to caramelize them. And uh, yeah, and they just look kind of mushy. So what I learned from a mushroom hunter that he learned from some chefs and now it's the common thing among chefs who are mushroom hunters is that after you've cleaned and cut up your mushrooms you throw them in a dry pan a dry cast iron pan that's on medium to medium high heat so you throw them in they start sizzling right away you keep use a metal spatula so you can keep them moved around without letting them stick to the pan and they keep moving and moving. And then you'll see steam come off. And that's what you're doing is you're driving off the moisture. And so you keep moving them as the steam comes off, move them, move them, move them. And at some point you'll know after, ah, you know, maybe three, four or five minutes, you'll notice that the volume of steam has declined. And that is your cue to then add some, uh, some cooking fat to the pan. You've driven off enough of the moisture that now that you're going to cook them in fat, you'll be able to caramelize them and they will be fantastically delicious and have a terrific texture. Uh, and so this technique is called a dry saute. So you can read about that in the book. You can look it up on the, on Ask Dr. Google about dry saute and learn all about it. And uh, mushroom cookbooks are starting to recommend that. Mm, yeah, that was a revelation again uh, for me because I do love eating mushrooms, but as you say, they quite often end up swimming in their own moisture. So, yeah, that was a fantastic tip. Um, and there is a lot of um, content in your book which it kind of addresses the um, gastronomic value of the mushrooms. Um, but going back, I suppose, to the foraging aspect, I did wonder, do they have much in the way of nutritional value um, and or medicinal value as well as just a taste sensation? Uh, yes, they do. They uh, mushrooms. I am not. I am not that kind of foodie or or uh, or nutrient oriented person. I will just be honest with you. I don't think about that aspect, but I know there are people who do. And I asked someone who was more oriented that way. So, what do you tell people when they ask what's the nutritional benefits of mushrooms? And she said, I just tell tell them that mushrooms have nutrients that plants and animal meat do not have. And that usually satisfies them. So that's my go-to. I just say, they have nutrients that other foods don't have. And, and I've covered my bases, basically. They, um, compared to, I will say, compared to plant foods, they have more protein, you know, aside from legumes, but next to carrots and potatoes and things, they have more protein, which is good. They also have some B and D vitamins that are um, hard to come by. And so they have those benefits. There are some that are uh, said to have medicinal benefits. And so lion's mane would be an example of that. The uh, uh, reishi mushroom that's very commonly used in traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, chaga, which uh, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote about how Russian doctors, Soviet doctors used chaga mushroom to combat uh, cancer successfully. And there's been some, a little bit of studies that may be supporting that. Uh, and so there are, I do address some medicinal mushrooms in the book, chaga, reishi. And uh, because a lot of people have interest in that, I, I, here's one thing I want to say about medicinal mushrooms or medicinal anything. Most medicinal plants or mushrooms are bitter and not appetizing. Chaga is the exception to that. I love chaga. It is. It grows on uh, out of trees in the northern part of the temperate region. 
and uh, it looks like a big chunk of charcoal growing out of the tree. Uh, it's but it's a beautiful, rich, and uh, appetizing brown color on the inside. And you crush this up because it's hard. It's like, uh, uh, gosh, I can't think of a good example. It's it's hard the way chalk is hard. Not an appetizing image, I'm afraid, but it's kind of hard. That So it's hard, but brittle. You can break it up. And I add chaga to my ground coffee uh, grounds when I'm making coffee. And it adds a flavor that I can't describe, but it's it's like coffee plus. And in the book, I I don't provide any recipes for these things, but I had my colleagues uh, send in links to their recipes. And there's a fellow who has a link to adding chaga to hot chocolate. So get this medicinal hot chocolate that tastes fantastic. So that medicinal mushroom medicinal stuff I can get behind. And I recommend folks check into that. Sounds amazing. <laughs> um, so my last question is, um, obviously, you don't want people to die when they're foraging for mushrooms. And that's what your book is about. I think there is still a lot of fear. Um, you know, what would you kind of say to somebody who was a little bit reticent about doing it? Hopefully their likelihood of dying is very, very minimal. <laughs> but, you know, if, if people are still a little bit worried, what would you say to encourage them to go out and forage for mushrooms? I would say this. I would say being concerned about dying is a healthy thing. That's what you want to bring to the table when you become a mushroom hunter. These mushrooms taste good, but they don't taste that good that it's worth risking getting sick or dying or making somebody else sick or dying. Who wants that on their conscience? And so uh, what all of us mushroom hunters say, if you're not 100% sure, then just, just don't eat it. Uh, the, uh, the folks who do generally, here's a general rule. The folks who do get sick or die from mushrooms are people, uh, who, and by people, I mean, men, let's be honest, <laughs> are men who are more focused on impressing someone that they have found this amazing edible mushroom. And I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably sure that this one's the edible one. And then they cook it and eat it and everybody's sick. And so if you are mushroom hunting with somebody who aims to impress or doesn't have good judgment in other fields, then I would not accept their invitations to eat mushrooms at their house. That's that's how I would put it. If you're a careful person, then you will be a great mushroom hunter. That's what's required is just an ability, the humility to be careful. And uh, to double check uh, the information and the and the way I set up this book, again, it was for beginners. And so it's very cut and dried. If you have a mushroom in front of you and you find something that looks similar in my book, it will have a checklist. One, two, three or four things. And if the answer is if your mushroom that you're looking at has all four of those qualities, then it is safe to eat. So that's the sense in which a lot of mushrooms are easy to learn is that there's might be a checklist of two things or three things or four things, and you will be good to go. But it's be, taking it to that level of carefulness is the key thing. Uh, if you're around somebody who's sort of careless, then don't eat their mushrooms. That's how I would, how I would uh, suggest people could be safe. Thank you very much, Frank, for being such an entertaining guest and for sharing your passion for mushrooms. We recorded the interview over Zoom during Storm Eunice, so apologies for any glitches. These were all on my end. I'm recording this now as well during the height of the storm, so you may be able to hear her raging in the background, despite my best editing efforts. Thanks to you for listening, and to all of you who rated and reviewed the podcast lately. It definitely helped get the podcast out to more people, so please keep rating the podcast in whichever app you listen. I hope you can join me again next week. And in the meantime, Dr. Ian Bedford is here with the lowdown on something we've probably all had enough of over the past couple of years. It's thought that around 4 billion years ago, the first celled organism was spawned on Earth from an ocean of organic molecules, and that it became the origin of all future life. But around that time, something else extraordinarily different appeared too, which is still around today.
an imperceptibly small invisible thing, comprising of just genetic material wrapped in protein, and with no capability of generating its own energy. And, perplexing modern-day science as to whether it's a living entity or not, it remains a mystery as to how it could have formed in the first place, and how it acquired the system it employs to proliferate, as a parasite of the cellular life forms infiltrating their cells and using the components within for its own replication. But over thousands of millions of years, as the cellular life forms evolved and diversified into species, so did the parasite, often forming a specific association with its host as it augmented its replication procedure and its method of dispersing to new hosts. And to this very day, the parasite, unable to sustain itself without a suitable host, affects all known life forms on Earth, whether it be bacteria, animal or plant. And it's become the planet's most numerous biological entity, infinitely greater in number than stars in the universe. And we will know only too well about the devastating impact that some of these cell parasites have on our lives, since they are what we call viruses. And we'll certainly be aware of the way that animal viruses can disperse from an infected host to a new one, and the fact that an animal's immune system can respond to fight the invader. But what about the vast number of viruses that infect plants? Well, they've had to evolve a different set of strategies that enable them to replicate and disperse to new hosts. Because even though plants share that same common ancestor as animals, they've evolved different cell structures and have very different biological characteristics. One advantage that plant viruses have over animal viruses, though, is that they usually have longer time to develop and spread within their host, since the systems that plants might employ to fight a pathogen are not as rapid or effective as those that animals use. The main disadvantage, though, is that plants are not mobile like most animals, so plant-infecting viruses have had to develop different ways to infect new hosts. So whilst those that are very highly transmissible might spread when plants sway and touch each other in the wind, others might be commandeering the bodies of insects. Insects such as aphids, leafhoppers and whitefly, whose needle-like mouthparts pierce plants to suck out sap, which, from infected plants, will contain transmissible virus particles. And these types of viruses will often have exclusive associations with a specific insect species and the unique ability to pass through that insect's gut wall and accumulate in its saliva, where they'll remain to be transmitted to new plants when the insect next feeds. However, for viruses to function most effectively, especially when they have a tritrophic interaction between a pathogen, a host and a specific animal vector, they'll need time to evolve and adapt, since it's not beneficial for the virus to kill its host or impair its ability to spread. And this is demonstrated by many wildflowers that have had long associations with insect-transmitted viruses, where the pathogen harmlessly replicates and spreads within the plant, enabling it to grow, flower and to produce seeds normally. But it often reveals its presence with symptomatic mosaic patterns on the leaves, which invariably are yellow, a colour that just happens to be highly attractive to those virus-vectoring, sap-sucking insects. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.